Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my organization, Orchid Studio, and the, the way in which we're practicing, which I think is a little bit different uh, from a lot of practices. Uh, it's particularly focused on sub-Saharan Africa, but I think there's a lot of broader uh, themes that hopefully are relevant in, in a Western practice. Um, so we, we set up in 2008. Uh, it was something I actually began at university as a very naive uh, venture to Uganda, um, entirely self-run, to go and work with the community. And we, we built a community kitchen, which is the, the one here on the right. Um, and it, it was very much uh, a kind of informal and, and ad hoc way of getting involved in development work in that we went with no assumption of, of what we could actually provide or that we could give anything, but instead learned from the community and, and were really at their mercy. We then went on and, and built in South America. We've built in Southeast Asia as well, but we're, we've now got an office set up in, in Nairobi and we're, we're based there pretty much full time doing all of our work in and around the sub-Saharan part of the continent. Uh, a project that we just completed, because um, I'm not really going to show much architecture this afternoon, uh, is this one in Sierra Leone. It was a large girls' school that we started uh, in 2012, 13. Um, we then ran in, uh, up to when the Ebola outbreak hit and um, had to finish it off uh, a few weeks ago. Um, this is the, the building here. Um, so it was quite a, quite a challenging environment to work in and a slightly different way uh, of dealing with, with a, a very specific challenge. Um, but there's sort of four key values that underpin our practice, and the first of that is inspire. So it's this idea that, that aesthetic value or, or good design means something, uh, and it means something to people. Uh, now that's something that we as architects here probably all, all share and, and agree with, but often when you're dealing with people who have very little, there's this sense that necessity demands something that doesn't include good design or doesn't include aesthetics. Uh, whereas we believe that without um, splashing out on the budget too much or, or designing overly flamboyant architecture, we can still value good design and that people with nothing still have an aesthetic opinion. Equality is a major theme for us, um, and that's quite far ranging, but one of the biggest areas that we're engaged in is, is gender equality. We employ at least 50% women on all of our construction sites, which if you walk on a construction site in the UK would be a, a remarkable site. Um, and they're doing exactly the same jobs as the men and paid exactly the same wage as the men. And so we're starting to feel, or starting to find that we're having huge impact just in the way that people perceive the role that design can play in solving problems, but also uh, the role that a particular group of people can have within society. The third theme is empower, which is uh, actually a, another key thing I'll talk about, which is working with local businesses. Uh, and thinking that, that giving something or gifting something to people is not actually enough and won't really encourage development, but that we actually have to work to expand the private sector locally uh, to give people or work with people to create better businesses um, and how that can actually then generate capital for better infrastructure and sanitation. Um, and finally, educate, which is particularly a strong one on our projects in the sense that we don't have a lot of the red tape that exists around construction uh, in a country like the UK. Uh, a lot of the time that can be abused to, to create um, just anything for, for anyone, but it also creates a fantastic opportunity uh, to engage people from all sorts of backgrounds in construction. And it's not a case of us going out there and teaching people how to build, but it's a case of learning how people already build uh, learning from what we already know and combining that in a kind of exchange or sharing of knowledge on site. So most of you will have seen a diagram like this or will have heard of the kind of phrases like the, the other 99% or the, the privileged 1%. Um, one of the things that got me into this work in the first place was a reaction to uh, the architecture that I was being taught at university and, and the way I saw the profession. And what, what surprised me was um, I heard a a quote um, some, some years ago now that about 10% of the buildings in the UK have had an architect involved with them. And I thought it's quite a shockingly low number given that our profession is meant to be so important. Um, I thought, well, if only 10% of the people in the UK have received uh, or work, work or live in buildings designed by an architect, what is it like for the rest of the world? And uh, not surprisingly, it's actually a very similar percentage. Around 1% or 2% of people in the world live in architect design buildings or use architect design buildings on a daily basis. Um, so what does that mean from a, a 
business perspective, which is not something that's often talked about alongside architecture. And if any of you are familiar with this, it's a diagram called the diffusion of innovation theory. And it's often applied to products, but it can also be uh, applied to services. And it's the notion that um, when you first uh, innovate or create a, a product or a service, you expect to get a, a few percent of that market share. Uh, you then, as you as you grow, hopefully, you get you get an early adopters. And those are, those are the people that are a bit braver, a bit bolder, want to take a chance on something. Uh, you then get your early majority who are following the crowd, um, your late majority who are, are, don't really get out very much, and, and your laggards who, who are never going to go from a, a Nokia to an iPhone or, or whatever it is. Um, if you look at that with the UK market, where we still haven't got to our early adopters, which means that we're, we're constantly innovating, and that's great, but it also means that there's not a, a particularly big demand for our services in a lot of projects. If you look at the global market, it, it reduces even more, and we're, we're barely even having any kind of impact whatsoever. Um, relate that to uh, the kind of typical uh, relationship on projects in the UK, and, and as many as you will know, many of you might be involved in projects like this in your practices, the architect now is, is if anything, separated from the client and is a subcontractor alongside the other consultants. And so your relationship directly with people and the people that you're wanting to help is separated, or you're working for a, a client who represents the people who are then going to use your building. And so the, the social aspect to our practice is, is often disconnected. Um, I'm going to then slightly revert back to Africa, and this is a diagram that shows um, housing shortage relative to the number of trained design professionals or architects. Um, it, it's quite simple to read. The, the red circles represent the number of architects, the blue circles is the housing shortage. So in Africa you have a huge housing shortage with barely any architects, and, and in the West we have um, far too many architects arguably for, for the housing shortage. Um, Italy has 150,000 registered architects um, in the country. It is a brilliant example because it has more registered architects per person than any other country in the world. Um, but Africa has 35,000, um, and Africa is infinitely bigger than Italy. Um, so what, what is Africa? Um, I think that's quite a, quite a simple question, but actually quite a, uh, one with a lot of answers. Um, people often refer to Africa as a country. Um, hopefully nobody in this room, but uh, it does happen. Um, it's actually 54 countries. It has an estimated 2,000 different languages, um, and it's more than three times the size of the United States. Uh, it has 1.1 billion people. It's a major and very, very diverse place. Uh, one of my favorite kind of examples of Africa was Attenborough's BBC Africa series when it opened with blizzards on top of a snow top mountain and I thought that is sort of the polar opposite to what people assume from that continent but it is incredibly diverse in people in geography um, but it also presents an opportunity uh, it, well it presents two things it presents a need and it presents an opportunity there's only one architect uh, for every 31,000 or so people in Africa compared to the UK, one to 471, Italy, one to 391. Um, so both, both the private sector demand there, but also a huge amount of need, people not potentially receiving uh, expert guidance or input into how their built environment is controlled and developed. So these are things that won't be uncommon. You learn them at university. Hopefully you continue them throughout your practice. But architects, you know, we must understand people. We must understand place and we must understand culture, but when we're working, certainly in the context of Africa, we must understand development rather than just the specifics of how to build something. So I'm going to quickly gloss over this, but, but what, what is development and, and how is it delivered? Um, there's three broad types, uh, humanitarian, which is uh, in the post uh, or aftermath of a, some kind of uh, disaster uh, and provision of relief. There's charity base, which is donating your, your 10 pounds a month or whatever it is, and, and people going grassroots on the ground and helping others. And then you have your systematic aid, so governments and, and large organizations like the International Monetary Fund transferring money uh, between each other. Aid began in the, in the 50s. It was uh, actually um, the Americans giving to Europe initially, bore the concept of aid after the Second World War, and then it moved to Africa in the Cold War. I'm not going to go through this in, in any depth because um, of the limited time, but essentially aid, aid transformed and changed um, and has often been criticized as a way of controlling uh, previously colonial states and, and getting hands on resources and so forth. But the long and short of it is that um, over... That period up until the 2000s, about a trillion dollars uh, went to Africa uh, to develop it, and, and it's not developed. 
Um, and in that same time, or even shorter period from 81 to 2010, the World Bank reckoned that about 700 million people had been lifted out of poverty. Uh, 627 million were in China. Uh, and of course, China is now a uh, fantastically rapidly growing uh, economy. Uh, so Africa really hasn't, hasn't transformed at all. Uh, 2010s now, the, the, the theme is slowly changing, but the aid industry is still a hugely undermining factor in how we practice. Um, many of you will be familiar with something like this, the kind of the African child symbolizing uh, an entire continent. Um, it, it does exist, but most of the African children I've met are incredibly happy, um, have very little, but, but certainly uh, don't always look like this. Um, but what does, that, what does that really mean, and what's the impact of giving all of that money? Um, this is a, quite a common analogy that's used to demonstrate why aid doesn't work. Um, it, it's fairly simple. Many of you will um, have been appealed to to give something like five pounds to buy a mosquito net to, to stop somebody getting malaria. Uh, and on the kind of basic level, that's fantastic. Uh, but in that country, wherever that organization is operating, there will be a, uh, or a company producing nets, and they'll produce maybe 500 nets a week, which is nowhere near enough to keep up with demand, plus most people won't be able to afford them in any case, so you, you have this major problem that they're trying to address. Um, in Africa, there's about 10 to 15 people per employed person who are dependent on that employed person, so that company is propping up 150 or so people, let's say, um, in, that, in that economy. The foreign NGO, with all goodwill and intention, come in and you know, dump half a million or 100,000 or whatever free nets. And so suddenly everybody's very happy. They've got their net. The, the NGO can, can come back to the UK or wherever and say that malaria rates have massively declined. Uh, and they will have. Uh, but three years down the line or so, when those nets are broken, stolen, or, or lost, and nobody can afford to buy any more, that NGO can either not get the same funding again or has already moved on to the new place to record records, drops in malaria incident numbers, and you have a total market collapse. There's no, that, that company's now gone out of business uh, and there's no way of getting nets to people, so the problem is just perpetuated. Um, one thing that, that is kind of maybe a, a good way of summarizing that is that if 10% of the architects in this country were funded to do, give their services for free, I can guarantee the other 90% would probably very quickly lose all of their work. Um, and so it, it's that sort of effect that that, that works having. So how do, we, how do we get around that? And architecture has traditionally been a service, a, a provision, a consultancy, um, or at least nowadays is. Uh, and so one of the ways that we're starting to practice, which is quite different to that, is, is becoming what we're potentially calling a market innovator or just shifting the position of the architect within that process. So it's a model of practice driven by an understanding of development, enterprise, and cooperation. Uh, and this is where I come back to Helen. Um, so this is, this is now Helen's house. And this is a, a very basic structure that we built using earth bags and timber. Um, but it came off the back of this project. Uh, and this was a large children's home that we, we built in 2014. Um, it was uh, our first construction in that particular uh, area um, of, of Nakuru in Kenya. Um, and it was really aimed at transforming the institutional children's home and, and giving children a, a more personalized and, and private space to grow up in. Um, as I say, it was constructed from earth bags, and, and the, the earth bags was a fantastic construction method. It was cheap, it was easy, and it also lasts for decades. Um, so everybody suddenly got very excited. They thought, well, it, bags are so cheap, if I can get my hands on those, then I can suddenly build my own house, or I have a skill that other people don't have. Um, and that, that only the 30 people that we taught on our site have in the whole of Kenya. So I can use that to get more work and get work from other people. We were enthusiastic. We thought we're going to come back in a year and everybody's going to have built uh, earth bag houses and it's going to have transformed this community. Um, a year later, we came back uh, and nothing, nothing had been built, um, which was probably not a surprise. Um, but we, we, we thought we can't just leave it at that. Why, why had nothing been built? Why had that enthusiasm not translated into tangible results and impact? Uh, one of the reasons was the scale that we worked at. We, we built with a crane. Um, if you ever get a chance to boss around a crane, it's brilliant. Um, but it's also something that your average um, African who's not necessarily built before or hasn't had an architectural or engineering education is not going to, to understand how, how to coordinate all of that without any prior training. Uh, and similarly, how do you transform something which was such a big scale building into just a domestic uh, building, e potentially easy for, for us in this room, but if you haven't had that kind of creative background, uh, it's a little bit more challenging. 
So we, we set about to design a house, something that would use the same techniques um, on a much smaller scale. We weren't particularly interested in what that house looked like from an architectural perspective. We weren't particularly interested in telling people how they should live or whether they should have a living room here and, and what configuration of bedrooms. We were far more interested in designing something that taught rules of thumb. So understanding at what point, without having to know the engineering behind it, if you increase a certain span, you need to increase the size of your, your members within that or so on and so forth. And having that tacit knowledge as being the kind of underpinning of how you would then build. Uh, we developed a series of booklets which, um, which, which, without any need for English language, communicated that and backed up that knowledge. Um, and then we set about building, and this was Helen's house under construction. It was built by 14 women, including herself, uh, from that community. Uh, they, were, they were far quicker uh, with the earth bags than the men were on the previous project. Um, and they learned skills that are in inherently uh, male trades, so um, plastering, um, they're fantastically plastered walls um, on, on the house, given that they'd never done it before. Um, and this was the house about a week before completion. And what was brilliant about this was that we actually had to leave at this point. Uh, we had another project to go on to. And um, normally I panic at that point because I think, gosh, no one's going to know how to finish it. Uh, this project where we had totally given control of running the site, every decision that was made was made by those women. And if it meant that work stopped for a day, work stopped for a day. Um, they finished that building a week later, sent me photos, um, and it looked as good as I, I would have hoped to have done it myself. Um, so what, I'll just put this in briefly, but our biggest aim as foreigners working development must be to design up the need for our being there and, and building a thriving private sector and public service provision with the local people. So we're, this is slightly contrary to your kind of standard business model in the sense that we don't actually want the demand for our work to increase. If anything, we want uh, to make sure that in five, 10 years, we're not needed in that community. And this was a small step in that direction. Uh, that's Helen's old house, um, two rooms, um, eight children. Helen's 32, uh, first child at 11. Um, and she represents uh, a very common issue in rural Kenya, which is uh, single mothers with high numbers of dependents who are reliant upon a seasonal uh, source of income through agriculture and are paid not enough to ever save. Um, that's her on our new site uh, that we bought for her. Um, and that's her in the house. But we didn't gift Helen the house, and that was the crucial element. Uh, we provided her with 10 chickens, and the, the money for the house was on a 0% interest loan. Um, we're a year on from that house, and Helen's made every single repayment since. She's tripled her income, um, and she's now got about 30 chickens, um, hoping to scale to dairy soon. Um, I've got a minute left, so I'm just going to quickly uh, rush to the next bit. But the, the project we're doing now is we're, we're setting up um, dairy farms with uh, women's cooperatives in Kenya. The idea being that through uh, raising money from the sale of milk, uh, women can generate the capital for their project and deliver housing. We're hoping that three years from now we'll have built about 300 houses for 300 women. We're working with the Kenya Commercial Bank and everything's being funded through, um, develop, uh, through financial services rather than foreign aid money. Um, so what does, that, what does that mean for Orca Studio? Are we architects? Um, often I don't think we are. I spend maybe two days a year in, in a design studio. Um, we're contractors because we build. We're arguably dairy farmers. Um, uh, and I've learned a lot about cows that I never thought I'd know. Um, we're, we're doing a project with maize in Cameroon. Um, and, and are we something else, entrepreneurs, or, or, or for want of a better word, you know, creating other things and, and, and starting businesses? Um, this was from an RIBA report actually saying that in 10 years we probably won't call ourselves an architecture practice. Um, it will be something entirely else. Our team as well is, is made up of not many architects as um, uh, economists, developers, um, people. We've also got a, an increasing size of team in Kenya as well now. Um, and this is just my, the last bit to finish. We're, um, I, I also lecture at the Macintosh School of Architecture in Glasgow, um, albeit never really in Glasgow. Um, but we're setting up with the University of Rwanda and Kigali a master's program that will look at the development of the built environment through uh, more enterprising or private sector means. Um, and I think it's a critical thing to start to develop Africa's architects for Africa rather than um, just somebody like myself or, or another Western architect having to do that work because that's great for now, but it's not definitely not the future for the continent. Um, and this is the very last slide. Um, this is a theory called the Golden Circle Theory. There's a brilliant TED talk on it. I highly recommend 
that you watch it. Um, but it effectively reasons that the most successful people or companies in the world start with why and then get to what. Apple's a prime example. If Apple, Apple bring out a car tomorrow, you'll buy it because you, or, or you won't if you hate them, but you'll buy it because you buy into Apple, you buy into everything that they stand for. Um, so the sort of parting message, particularly from a leadership perspective that, that I'd like to leave today is um, it's really not that important what you do. Um, it's great if you love designing buildings, and, it, and it's great if that's the way that you choose to, to do things. I love designing buildings, but I found myself doing things. My what has become substantially different from that. But the one thing that I feel I, I know, or at least I'm, I'm interested in, is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so whether you end up becoming a dairy farmer in Africa or whether you end up staying in your practice here, either are fine and both are great. Um, but trying to understand why you do something, I think, is, is a fantastic uh, place to be. Thank you very much.